Today's scripture passage comes from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 14. A little bit longer than usual, but also some familiar parts, but here we go. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am, and you will know where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come through the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. For from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and then we'll be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but the Father who lives within me does the work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work that you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done, even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. In 1966, an issue of Time Magazine came out with theologian Karl Barth. And there he was quoted by saying, take your Bible and take your newspaper and read them both, but interpret the newspapers from your Bible. This week, with my Bible open to John 14 and my news apps feeding me stories about civil unrest in a country that is really close to my heart, the words of our scripture struck me in a fresh way. Now, I've found that when we read our scripture in a different location or a different headspace, kind of closer to that original audience, there are some new layers of scripture that are uncovered for us. For example, reading the creation narratives or the story of Jesus walking on water hits different when we're on a hike or in a boat, rather than when we're in the office or driving to a doctor's appointment. So keeping this in mind, I want to share with you how this scripture and the world events uncovered something in this scripture new for me. So this past week, there had been a state of emergency called in Haiti. Following riots and prison breaks and an attempt to take over their international airport. Well, as I read stories, I can't help but think about my friends who were confined to their homes only to go out for the essentials, kind of like we were, when we were back in lockdown during COVID. My heart breaks for this beautiful culture and these beautiful people who have been longing for just basic human necessities, and they've been forced to endure being on the brink of civil war since I can remember. As news came in and stories developed, I saw pictures of streets that I'd walked down, spaces that I had been in just a little over a year ago. And it's heartbreaking. It's hard to even fathom. My family's last trip to Haiti was very short, but I didn't understand the significance of our guide, this gentleman who made sure that we were safe until this week. It really sank in as those news stories kept flooding my newsfeed. Now see, arriving at the airport about a year and a half ago, we met a friend who told us to stay with her coworker, who would get us through security and make sure that we were safe until we could catch our return flight home. And while the activity around the airport was different than previous trips, I couldn't help but think that, well, I could have navigated this airport on my own. I mean, come on, how hard could it have been? We've done it before. Regardless, on a rather stressful trip, it was a relief that our friend said, go with him, he knows the way. He knows the way. 
Today we continue on with our What's in a Name series. We have discussed Jesus being the name above all names, and Jesus given, being given the title of friend or teacher. And this week, our scripture leads us to one of the more difficult passages in our gospel because it carries some baggage along with it. However, we're also given a new name, that Jesus is the way. Our scripture jumps right in with Jesus telling the disciples that he's not going to be with them because he's going to make a place for them. And he reassures the disciples that there is plenty of space for where he is going. I mean, think about that. Have you ever been in a situation where there wasn't enough space for you? Either a lack of planning or simple logistics, you find yourself on a trip in the sleeping arrangement math just doesn't add up and there's this like remainder of you. Usually this means that you're sleeping on the floor or needing to camp outside. I was talking to some of our church members a little while ago and we were reminiscing about youth retreats and packing way too many kids into a small hotel room or a rental house. And while that makes for a fun weekend story to like look back on, I don't know that it would be too sustainable for the long haul. You know, that kind of timing that Jesus is talking about. And so with that in mind, Jesus gives these words of comfort to the disciples as he prepares for his death, and they're still trying to comprehend that. This scripture passage is often used during funerals. It reminds us that we have a future of hope because Jesus has gone before us. Jesus has made a way and prepared a place for us. There's a future and a hope that when we go to spend eternity, it's not going to be on a futon or an uncomfortable hide-a-bed or on the floor. Jesus is the way. And there is a hope for the future because of that. Someone has gone before us, has blazed a path for us, and so Jesus opens up the possibility of atonement and reminds us that there is life in following in the way, the way that he has set out. But Jesus is more than just a future hope. There's more than following the way than just waiting for heaven or killing time. Our faith isn't so simplistic that our time here on earth is just to run out the clock. Additionally, it's not to convict people of other faith backgrounds that they are condemned if they don't follow our very human understanding of life and salvation. This is partly because coercion and shame are not the way of Jesus but it's also because God's grace is bigger than our own narrow perspective. Jesus is more than a future of hope. He is hopeful here and now. This is difficult for us to compute today, and it was clearly tough for the disciples too, who had spent years with Jesus. In our scripture, Thomas and Philip push back on this idea that he's going away to prepare a place for us. They push back against Jesus's words, and they res and the response that they get basically tells them that they have been encountering the way the whole time. My words aren't mine. They're the Father's. You've encountered me, and so you know the Father's love. Jesus is not making a way for the disciples. He is the way. And if there's any trouble along the way, Jesus will help navigate that changing landscape. It's a little bit like our GPS recalculating your route because of a traffic jam ahead or something going on. It's not like the paper map quest directions that if you got off track, you hoped and prayed that you could find your way back. Jesus is the way. And so he is there helping recalculate and get us back on track. The power of the way being here with us now, more than just a destination though, didn't hit me until I thought about navigating that airport over a year ago in Haiti. After our friend had handed our family off to our guide, whose name we never got, he looked at us and said, I will be your way home. Stay close. Now, I'm a little bit arrogant and prideful and think that I know better. Of course, I've been there before, whatever. And then the kind of what happened next, what transpired was a series of detours line skipping, and conversations with very particular people that got us safely to where we need to go. There was even a little bit of chastising when I tried to talk to someone from the airport who I wasn't supposed to. I told you not to talk to them. Move this way. Ooh. And when we arrived back in Florida safe and sound a few hours later, I thought that I could have navigated that airport maze myself. 
And it was about at that time that I decided to turn my phone off of airplane mode and messages started dinging my phone about our safety, asking if we were okay. And it had turned out that there had been a disruption at the airport and some violence had broken out. And while we were safely waiting for our plane, other stuff was happening. And we had no idea how precarious our safety was because he was our way. And Jesus does the same thing, taking the time to recalculate our path and at times leading us down a new path that is more life-giving and less treacherous than other options. And while our lives have hardships and seasons of grief and, you know, at times just really are hard, they would be much more bleak without the guidance of the way. If we're to follow the way, though, we must, in the words of our airport guide, stay close. This is an important reminder as we hear these words afresh today because this passage of scripture has led many to do harm in the name of Jesus. After all, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, if he's the only way to the Father, then followers of the way must let everyone know how wrong they are, right? That's our responsibility. When we walk in the way of Jesus, though, we live a life that reflects Jesus. And throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus choosing compassion and grace over fear and condemnation for all of those who think and practice differently. This passage that we just read comes on the heels of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. The way leads to paths of humility and love. There's this inscription on one of the chapel areas at the Washington National Cathedral. It's part of a larger Celtic prayer, but it reads, thou art the journey and the journey's end. And it could be said that Jesus is the way and is the way's end. Jesus is not just the future hope, but a present reality that we can be agents of change here and now. Additionally, when we follow the way, there's an implication that we are on the move because we are still a work in progress. And with that, this week, I would challenge you to take this passage of scripture with you, maybe the whole thing or just a, a short snippet of it, and read it twice daily. The first time, read it or repeat it while you're walking outside, while you're moving, while you're on the way somewhere. And the second time, could be to start your day or during a time where you need particular discernment, asking God to lead you down that way. Make this scripture your prayer this week. Jesus promises not just to show us the way, but he is the way and will bring us into an abundant life. As we walk in the way, Jesus will shine through us, making this world look a little bit more like the one that we hope for in the future. Amen.